a number of internally renowned medical leaders to Singapore to share their knowledge, experience, insights with the local community. The program was made possible by Dr. Un, an NUS alumna, and one of Singapore's pioneering obstetricians and gynecologists. Her keen belief in the importance of understanding the factors and influences that shape women's health, as well as her abiding interest in healthy aging and a dementia research led her to establish the Un Chu Sing Fellowship in Medicine in 2011 along with uh, the Unchu Sting Distinguished Visitor Program, which we're here for today. We've consequently been honored uh, by visits from a number of leading academics, including professors Edward uh, Koo, the Nobel Laureate, John O'Keefe, uh, Richard uh, uh, Wawi, uh, Nicholas Fox, Jay Luxembourg, and Christine Yaffe, a wonderful list of speakers, and we have another one tonight. Um, this evening, we're privileged to hear from an authority who spent many years working to improve care for elderly people in his country. Dr. Lou uh, Lipsitz is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's also the director of the Institute for Aging Research at Hebrew Senior Life, uh, formerly called the Hebrew Re Rehabilitation Center. And he's chief of the Division of Gerontology at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, all, of the, all of these are in Boston. His research focuses on age-related altercations in blood pressure and cerebral blood flow regulation and their uh, relation to falls, syncope, uh, for instance, fainting, and also cognitive dysfunction. Uh, through the course of his distinguished career, Dr. Lipsitch has brought visionary leadership to the field of aging and inspired strong, uh, strong applied research programs while providing unceasing compassionate care for elderly people. His lecture this evening will review what we can expect as we experience the aging process in Singapore and how we can remain healthy and productive in our later years. These are insights that we will certainly value given the challenges that we face in this country uh, as we care for an increasingly aging population. So it's really my pleasure to welcome Dr. Dr. Lipsitz to the stage. Thank you very much for coming this long way and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brian. It's really quite an honor to be here. And I'd like to start by thanking, um, first of all, Dr. John Wong, who invited me to be here. Uh, we got to know each other in Boston, actually, um, about a year ago. Um, and I have a special thanks, really, for uh, Dr. Eun Chu Singh and her family. I had the honor of meeting her yesterday as I was walking in the door and uh, realized she was 102 years old, so she looks much younger than that. And um, in fact, she told me the secret of a long and happy life. Um, mahjong was her, uh, her passion, and so um, I'm going to have to go home and start practicing that. So thank you uh, for that introduction. I would like to uh, share with you uh, information that I'd garnered over the years and uh, some of our research. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the uh, experience of aging. This is the outline I would like to cover. Uh, first, with regard to what to expect, I'd like to discuss uh, the changing, rapidly changing demographics that we're all experiencing around the world, current challenges to those demographics, and recent advances in research, training, and healthcare policy. And with regard to how to prepare for aging, I would like to discuss a bit about what I see the future of America and our, of uh, aging in our own country, America, and how that might uh, also impact you here in Singapore, and what we might do to prepare for an old age, in addition to playing mahjong. So curiously, aging is really a young field. Um, the study of aging really started in our country in 1975 with the um, institution of the National Institute on Aging. And the first fellows, myself included, uh, really didn't train until the uh, late 1970s and early 1980s. So it is a young field. And part of the reason for that is that a century ago, very few people lived to old age. The average life expectancy in 1900 was about 47 years. But now, that baby boom uh, generation, born after the world, uh, World War II, um, is turning 70. About 10,000 baby boomers are turning 70 every day in our country. So this is huge. Um, this older population will soon comprise 20% of our population. 
Um, and as a result, there are just enormous social, medical, economic, and ethical challenges facing us all. So this is really an interdisciplinary problem. We need many disciplines to tackle it. But the good news is that there are many opportunities in this field to apply advances in science, engineering, and healthcare uh, to improve the health of our older population and the well-being of older adults. This is just some data on the rapidly uh, expanding elderly population around the world. And um, of course, the population that's growing the fastest is very close to you here in J Japan. But Singapore is really not far behind. Here in the light blue line uh, is uh, Singapore. And you can see a very, very rapid growth in the population, such that nearly 30% of the population will be over age 65 by 2050. The United States population is, of course, also rapidly aging, and we estimate that by 2030, the number of people over 65 will double from 35 million today to 72 million people. But the uh, age over 85, shown here in the, whoops, I'm sorry, in the purple, is the most rapidly growing segment of our population, um, which is expected to grow from 4 million to 9 million uh, by 2030. Now, this older population consumes a lot of our resources. 36% um, of hospital stays, 49% of hospital days, um, and 50% of all physician hours are devoted to the care of older people, costing our uh, insurance program, uh, Medicare, $26 billion. Now, life expectancy is a concept I'd just like to explain for a minute. Um, and this is rapidly increasing, as shown on this slide. Um, life expectancy is shown on the green line here. And this is really the age at which 50% of the population can expect to live uh, from birth. So you can see that life expectancy in 1900 or so was around 50 years of age. And over the last century, it has been increasing. Um, initially, back in the 1900s, there was a big drop off in life expectancy because of um, death in early childhood and delivery of, of babies. Um, and then accidents and disease would take the lives of people much earlier in life. But with better maternal and child health and, and sanitation, antibiotics, life expectancy has been increasing. And today it's uh, 80, close to 80 years. Um, but another concept in this slide is lifespan. Lifespan is thought to be the maximal number of years a species can live. And we know now, actually, it's a bit over 100 years. It's probably close to 115 years. Um, and, and Dr. Una is actually uh, proving that it can be over 100 years. Um, and this hasn't really changed that much over the years. So we really don't know whether we can increase lifespan. Um, and in a moment, I'll talk to you a bit about some of the implications of that. This also illustrates the marked increase in life expectancy that we've seen. Um, but what's interesting here is that in all years, women live longer than men. So the life expectancy of women is greater than it is of men. And this is one of the fundamental questions in gerontology, the study of aging. Why is it that women are the stronger sex and are living much longer than men? Um, we need to really understand some of the biological underpinnings of this difference. Now, with this expansion of uh, the older population and living longer, unfortunately has come some increase in disability. And this slide shows that here in men in blue and in women in light green. You can see the percent of individuals over 65 with various disabilities. Uh, from stooping and kneeling to reaching over, writing, walking, lifting, and any of these. And here, the uh, results are the opposite of what I've just shown you. It's the women that have more disability. And we often say that men die of their diseases, women suffer from their diseases. And this is true, again, they're the stronger sex, right? They unfortunately have to uh, experience disability as they age. So our challenge in the field of geriatrics and gerontology is to reduce that disability so that people can live healthy lives until the full lifespan. The reason for these uh, dis disabling uh, conditions uh, are heart disease, which leads the list, cancer, 
chronic lower respiratory diseases, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, a huge problem we'll talk about in a minute, diabetes and infections. So what are some of the current challenges that this older population bring to us? Well, certainly, as I've just shown you, the increasing prevalence of disease and disability is a huge challenge for societies around the world. But one of the further challenges is dealing with that disease and disability because we have a shortage of trained professional, professionals in the field of aging. Unfortunately, uh, despite the great need, not a lot of people are going into the field of aging in a variety of different disciplines, not just medicine, but nursing and therapies, social services, and other other disciplines. And there's also a lack of research to help guide policy and practice. So we desperately need more research, and academic medical centers like this are really charged with a responsibility to generate that research so that we can do a better job of caring for this population. And in our country, particularly, we have unacceptably high health care costs, which are really consuming our economy. And um, if we don't do something about this, we won't be able to afford to care for ourselves or our people in the future. So let's talk about some of these challenges. The first set of challenges um, is really in the cycle of aging, and here are some of them. At age one, the big challenge is walking. At age two, it's keeping dry. At age 16, it's driving. By age 20, it's having sex. By age 30, it's having kids. At age 40, it's working. At age 65, it's retiring. At age 70, it's having kids again, grandkids. At age 80, it's having sex again. At age 85, it's driving again. At age 90, it's keeping dry again. And at 95, it's walking. So this is the cycle that we are concerned about. But in fact, these are, whoops, these are the geriatric syndromes we're often concerned about, incontinence, ambulation, or mobility, uh, sexual activity, uh, et cetera. So I'd like to review some of the major challenges that uh, we have in the field of aging and what were uh, some of the newer advances that are exciting and opportunities for addressing these challenges. Uh, I think the biggest challenge that we all face around the world is loss of memory or dementia. Obviously, Alzheimer's disease is the major cause of this. But loss of mobility, this is what challenges and threatens the independence of older people, causing if they fall, they develop fractures, they then lose their independence. The onset of diseases, certainly heart disease and cancer, are huge challenges in our societies. And then frailty, disability, pain, and mortality. But there are great opportunities uh, to solve these problems, um, and many of them are actually preventable. Our goal is not necessarily to increase lifespan. We may achieve that to some extent. But I think most of us in the field of aging, and most of my patients who are experiencing long life, are not particularly concerned about increasing length of life, but reducing the morbidity that occurs late in life. So here are several scenarios that I think are really important for us to think about as we uh, try to promote healthy aging. Currently, the current situation is that at 55 or 60, maybe a little bit later, morbidity begins to develop. These are the chronic diseases that begin to accumulate in many individuals as they age. And then death occurs maybe around 76, in this case, or 80 years of age. But what we, one option that gerontologists struggle with is life extension. Maybe we should be spending all of our efforts to try to extend lifespan. Well, we could try to do that, but it would not be very good if it were at the expense of more morbidity. So in this scenario, life extension might result in a longer period of time of suffering with disease and disability. So let's check that off. We don't really want that. Another option is to shift this curve to the right and uh, really be aggressive about preventing disease, which we should certainly do, in which case disease might start at a later age, but still increase so that there's this period of disability that we might have to suffer before we finally die. The real goal is compression of morbidity. We want to live a very healthy life, fully functional, until very late, and compress morbidity into a very short period of time. The ideal situation would be to live to our lifespan and then suddenly go. Um, what, so what our goal in gerontology is, 
is to increase what we call health span rather than lifespan. And uh, we, many of our research efforts and uh, efforts as clinicians are to keep people healthy as long as we can by preventing the onset of disease and disability. So the field of aging really begins earlier in life, in the 40s or 50s, when our goal is to make sure we're treating the hypertension, hyperlipidemia, sedentary lifestyles, poor diets, and obesity in older people, in, in people as they age, so that we can compress morbidity and live a longer health span. So let's talk about some of these challenges that I mentioned. The first is memory loss, and this is a huge and enormous uh, problem. It's an epidemic that we really need uh, to solve. It's a public health problem. Right now, about 5.5 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease. About a third of older adults in our country die of Alzheimer's disease or are associated dementias. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. But it does not just affect the patient, it also affects the caregiver. So for every patient that I have who comes to my office with dementia, I also have to care for the caregiver. There are 15 million caregivers in our country. They provide more than 18 billion hours of unpaid care, which interferes with their own lives and their abilities to be independent. In 2017, Alzheimer's disease cost our country $259 billion, and this is expected to increase to $1.1 trillion by 2050. Huge public health issue. It's true in Singapore as well. These are data I uh, obtained from the web, which again shows the prevalence of uh, dementia in Singapore, increasing dramatically and expected to increase quite high by 2050 and the incidence uh, each year is also rapidly increasing. The hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease are two abnormalities which are found in the brain and shown here, and most of you probably are aware of this, but one of the hallmarks is the amyloid plaque. That's here. This is a bunch of dead neurons in the um, brain that really interfere with the transmission of nerve impulses and cause dementia, which is the memory loss and impairment in functions that older people get as they develop Alzheimer's disease. Another hallmark is the neurofibrillary tangles, which are these um, phosphorylated proteins that occur in neurons and cause them to die. Um, these two hallmarks are really the basis of much of the research that's gone on in this field. It, the thinking is that if we could get rid of these two hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, we might be able to either prevent the disease or reverse it. But in the past, we haven't known how to detect this. Fortunately, we now have these very fancy PET scans um, that can actually light up these two proteins, abnormal proteins, in the brain. This is just one example of a PET scan that can actually show in Alzheimer's patients these amyloid deposits shown in red and orange here uh, compared to a control. So this is what a normal brain would look like, and this is what an Alzheimer's brain would look like. We can now do this with tau as well, uh, which is the protein that is located in the neurofibrillary tangles. And we can also look at glucose uptake in the brain to see the activity, the metabolic activity in the brain. And here, too, it's reduced in Alzheimer's disease compared to controls. So these types of tools now enable us to test new drugs and new interventions to see if, first of all, we can get rid of the amyloid in the brain, increase the metabolism of the brain, and thereby prevent some of the dementia from taking place. So this is exciting research. It's been going on in the last decade or so, and um, I'm sure that you're capable of measuring it here, um, but this is something that I think uh, will lead uh, to many more clinical trials to actually uh, prevent and or cure this disease. There have been many potential therapies. Unfortunately, we do not yet have a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, some of the earlier therapies were to restore a neurotransmitter in the brain called acetylcholine, uh, and there are now three drugs on the market that are used to do that. Another approach is to try to prevent neuronal damage um, and we have a drug uh, called memantine that can uh, do that to some extent. These drugs may slow the progression of the disease, but by no means do they cure it. Uh, one of the most important ways to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's is to treat cardiovascular disease risk, 
We do know that hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia are all related and might, in fact, um, predispose to dementia. So it is very, very important in our patients to be treating these risk factors for cardiovascular disease. There's been some work on reducing oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is what causes your banana peel to turn brown or the apple to turn brown when you cut into it. Um, unfortunately, uh, these treatments have not turned out to be very effective. Um, Anti-inflammatory drugs have also been tried because the brain gets inflamed when amyloid uh, is deposited. But again, uh, these have not uh, panned out. Um, and right now, much of the effort is to try to reduce amyloid deposits or tau deposits in the brain through a variety of drugs that might inhibit the production of um, toxic amyloid and even vaccines that might uh, enable our immune system to get rid of it. But I think there are some things we can do today. Uh, mental and physical exercise have both actually been shown to help retard the onset of dementia and improve cognitive function. Um, these are uh, not panaceas, but um, we do know that we can train certain types of um, cognitive function and improve them. And curiously, even physical exercise can improve cognitive function. And uh, some studies are now going on with a variety of different types of brain stimulation. Multisensory brain stimulation has been tried at MIT in our city um, and has some promise, at least in animals and other ways of uh, activating the brain through electrical stimulation have been tried. So I think there's some things uh, on the horizon, and I'm very hopeful that within the next decade or so, we'll begin to see some very promising drugs uh, and therapies uh, come out uh, to treat this, this disease. Uh, remember, use it or lose it. I tell all of my patients this. If we don't keep active in older age, if we don't use our brains, uh, they will atrophy, just as our muscles will. And uh, in fact, this has been demonstrated very nicely in a study uh, done a number of years ago now, actually almost a decade ago, in which um, um, older individuals were asked to volunteer to ch teach children in school classrooms. Um, they went through um, functional MRI scans before and after the volunteer um, activities took place. And these uh, scans lit up certain areas in the brain that were, had increased activity compared to controls who did not engage in these uh, activities. And you can see here in the blue are the subjects who actually engaged in teaching children in classrooms uh, compared to controls who were just uh, using, doing their daily, usual daily activities. And you can see a marked increase in the activity of three different areas of the brain that are certainly involved in a variety of cognitive functions. So remember, use it or lose it. So the second problem I highlighted are, is mobility problems. And this, of course, is something we all are concerned about. Um, many patients come to see me because of falls. And in fact, about 30% of community-dwelling older people fall each year. And as many as 50% of nursing home residents fall each year. This is really a serious problem with a very high rate of injury from fractures and intracranial bleeding, mortality and use of uh, medical services. Um, about 20% of falls cause serious injuries to the bone and brain. We have about 300,000 hip fractures in our country each year. And after that hip fracture, 50% of uh, individuals who fracture their hip need assistance uh, later um, to get around. 25% of them die. So this is truly a, uh, a problem. Uh, it costs about $50 billion a few years ago, and uh, the costs continue to increase. So what do we know about mobility problems? Well, they're due to many, many different things in older age, and it would take me hours to actually review each of those. But let me highlight a couple of things that are really opportunities for us to improve mobility. Um, this is a CAT scan of a thigh. Um, it kind of looks like a ham. Um, middle is the bone, narrow in the middle. What's the yellow? Well, that's muscle. And the red is fat. This is a healthy 30-year-old. And you can see that most of that cross-section of the thigh is composed of muscle. Now let's look at that same cross-section in an 80-year-old. 
What's happened? Well, we've lost muscle. That's called muscle atrophy, and we have replaced it with fat. This is occurring very, very commonly in many of us as we age. Well, here is the slide that illustrates that. Downhill decline, muscle mass declines with age. This has now been demonstrated. Um, we used to think that it was, all of it was a normal accompaniment of aging. But what else happens with aging? Well, exactly what you're doing right now. The activity levels of our, all of us decline with age. And we've discovered that, in fact, much, not all, but much of that muscle loss is due to the sedentary lifestyles, what you're doing right now. Um, and that, in fact, accounts for a lot of the uh, muscle loss, which then accounts for many of the falls that occur in older age. Now, the good news is that we can actually reverse some of this muscle loss and certainly the muscle strength loss that occurs with aging. Um, a number of years ago, uh, with uh, Dr. Maria Fiatteroni, we did a study of 100 frail nursing home residents aged 72 to 98 years of age. By the time the study was done, one person was 100 years of age. The mean age was 87. We randomized these individuals to 10 weeks of progressive resistance training of the quadriceps muscle. This was leg lifts to try to improve the strength of the quadriceps muscle. We exercised them at 80% of their repetition maximum, the maximum that they could, could lift, and continued that uh, three days a week for 10 weeks. And what happened at the end of that? We had a 113% increase in muscle strength. We had a 12% increase in gait speed. 28% increase in stair climbing power, but only a 3% increase in thigh muscle area, interestingly. So it didn't take much increase in the muscle area to achieve a large increase in muscle strength. Many of these individuals could throw away their canes and walkers and function much better in that nursing home environment. So in fact, muscle strengthening exercises can be done in older people, they can be done safely, and they in fact result in improvements in muscle strength and function. We are also uh, in, uh, recognizing the role of cerebrovascular disease or microvascular disease. We all know that cerebrovascular disease causes strokes. They're often big strokes and they result in paralysis of one side or another. But we've recently been recognizing a condition called microvascular disease. And that's demonstrated here in these uh, CAT scans that, that show this white abnormality along the ventricles of the brain here on this left side and highlighted in red on the right. This is sometimes called white matter hyperintensities. Radiologists used to report it out as a normal concomitant of aging of no certain significance, um, consistent with age. Um, in fact, we do know that it does have significance. It is associated with slow gait, executive dysfunction. This is a type of cognitive dysfunction that uh, we need in order to multitask and plan and organize. It's associated with depressive symptoms. These three symptoms occur in about 17% of our older population and are associated with this white matter abnormality. And our risk, fa risk factors for this are hypertension and diabetes. So one of our efforts in our research to understand mobility problems is to begin to understand the cause of this microvascular disease and ways that we might prevent it, certainly by treating hypertension and diabetes, but also by trying to improve the blood flow to these regions to prevent the damage that this represents. We were talking before um, the lecture about vitamin D. Um, this is now a bit controversial. But in fact, many of our older patients are deficient in vitamin D because they don't get sunlight, at least in Boston in the winter. Here it may be different, although every day I've been here it's been raining. But um, uh, in Boston, they do not get sunlight for about, or much of it anyway, for about nine months of the year. And many older people don't drink milk because they have lactose intolerance and don't tolerate it. And milk is fortified with vitamin D. So many of them are deficient in vitamin D. And uh, studies, uh, meta-analyses, have shown that the relative risk of falls is actually reduced 
by vitamin D up to about 800 to 1,000 units, and then that risk might actually begin to increase a bit. So in my older fallers, particularly nursing home residents who do not get exposed to vitamin D, uh, we are replenishing it just with a simple vitamin pill. Um, now, this is relevant to the falls problem. Um, fractures recently have not been shown, at least in community dwelling elderly, to respond as much to vitamin D. But if people are deficient, uh, we still do give it. So what about medications? I'm always asked, isn't there a medicine yet to slow the aging process? And why am I asked that question? Well, it was uh, Sir William Osler uh, back in the early 1900s who stated the desire to take medicine is perhaps the greatest feature which distinguishes man from animals. Um, if only we could take exercise and put it in a pill, people would take it, right? But right now, getting them to exercise is, is a huge problem. Um, so there is a great desire to come up with a drug that's going to extend our lifespan, uh, reduce our morbidity. Um, there are some people who have lived long lives, and uh, Mrs. Un, uh, Dr. Un is certainly an example of that. Um, the longest lived person is Jean Calmet, lived 122 years. Uh, Antonio Todd was 113 when he died. And so people have asked them, okay, what's the secret that you have to a long life so we can replicate it? And she said the key to a long life are olive oil and port wine. And uh, Antonio said a sense of humor and a good glass of red wine every day. Do you see a, a convergent theme here, some kind of consistency? I, I kind of like that. Uh, so one of the thoughts uh, was that maybe uh, red wine was uh, the uh, key to a long and happy life. And Ponce de Leon, in fact, thought that 500 years ago. He drank his way around the Florida coast uh, during his expedition to find the legendary fountain of youth. So maybe it has something to do with red wine. Um, so one of the um, approaches to try to identify a compound that might um, prolong life actually comes from red wine. And this was resveratrol, uh, a compound uh, that um, has been shown, at least in some studies, in animals and yeast, to perhaps prolong life. This uh, has fallen out of favor because recent studies have not replicated that. So uh, I'm afraid to say that even though wine may have its benefits in other ways, uh, it's probably not through resveratrol. We used to think estrogen might prolong life. Uh, this too has not uh, panned out, nor growth hormone. But some of the candidates now are a drug called rapamycin, a drug used in oncology for cancer chemotherapy, uh, metformin, a drug used in diabetes, and nicotinamide, um, very, very important um, metabolite, uh, is also being tested uh, in clinical trials for life extension and for health span extension. Um, one good thing about um, th these kind of research in what we call geroscience, uh, the search for drugs that may prolong life, is that these drugs are not intended so much to increase lifespan, but to reduce our vulnerability to disease. If we can find something that can reduce vulnerability to disease, we would reduce all diseases, not just uh, one, this is not an approach that just cures one thing, cancer or heart disease, but these drugs and the whole science around them is really intended to increase our ability to adapt, to uh, overcome risk factors, and to prevent disease in general. So it's a very exciting field of, of research that um, is just beginning uh, to do clinical trials in some very exciting compounds. Um, another thing that's been promoted uh, is uh, all of these treatments, lowering blood pressure, lowering cholesterol, giving aspirin, vitamin D, could all be bundled into one poly pill that maybe we ought to be giving our old pa older patients a pill that contains all of this as an approach. And I think that also probably doesn't make sense, but um, uh, there are a number of different avenues of research to try to test uh, interventions uh, to improve the quality of life as well as the length of life. Um, many biological mechanisms have now been um, uncovered that are associated with longevity. And they were listed here in a very nice uh, diagram in uh, the journal called Cell. But now it's it really been shown uh, that there are a number of different mechanisms underlying life extension. The first that really was uncovered many years ago is caloric restriction. 
Um, and all animals from yeast all the way up through primates, restricting the caloric intake can actually prolong life, sometimes many fold. Um, so caloric restriction is unfortunately something that we as humans find very difficult to do. So one of the challenges is to look for what are the biological mechanisms underlying that effect, the life extending effect of caloric restriction. And a number of different mechanisms have been identified. Um, and they're just listed in this. But they include mitochondrial dysregulation, uh, cellular senescence, stem cell uh, exhaustion, uh, a variety of things, genomic instability, t telomeres, epigenetic um, alterations, et cetera. So a variety of drugs are now targeting these different mechanisms and will hopefully result in uh, improvements in health as well as longevity. Um, here are just some examples of the opportunities that are arising. And as I mentioned earlier, these opportunities will probably reduce the risk of not just one disease, but all diseases in aging. Um, some of the drugs and approaches are attacking uh, the insulin-like growth factor pathway. This has a lot to do with caloric restriction because this pathway is really inhibited um, during caloric restriction. Um, drugs, uh, compounds like sirtuins, mTOR, PIN1, are all being tested, metformin, NAD, rapamycin. The shortening of these little telomeres, which are like the ends of shoelaces, these shorten with age, and if we can find out why that is and restore the enzyme that lengthens these, we may be able to reduce some of the effects of aging. And then um, other drugs called senolytics. And we don't really have time to go into those in great detail, but um, these are really exciting opportunities that are just on the horizon. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to, to see some effects in the near future. Uh, but putting the medical issues aside, one thing that we also know can really help improve health and um, life um, uh, extension is actually social engagement. Um, one of the th this is really something that might underlie the longer lifespan of uh, women compared to men because they tend to be much more socially connected than men. Uh, we know that social connectedness through marriage, family, religion, and housing improves health, reduces mortality, enhances recovery from disease. Um, many of our older patients became isolated as they get sick and disabled. They, they are at home, they can't get out. Um, maybe they're visited occasionally by family members, but they really are relatively isolated and that compounds their disease burden to reduce their lives and th their life expectancy and their quality of life. So actually creating congregate env environments where people can get together, where they can support each other, may have profound impacts on the health of our older population. Well, another approach uh, to improving the health of older people is geriatric medicine. And I, I, being a geriatrician myself, I obviously am very excited about the field of geriatric medicine. Um, this is just an illustration of how geriatric medicine differs from many other fields. Many of the uh, fields of medicine are based on organs. There are specialists that like hearts, like cardiology, or kidneys, like renal, or neurology, uh, that focuses on the brain. And these I've sort of put as vertical pillars. Um, there are also a variety of disease-based specialties, like oncology, which looks at cancers, and immunology that looks at immune diseases and allergy, and ID, infectious disease, that looks at, obviously, infections. Um, these are other types of disciplines. But these three, uh, pediatrics, internal medicine, and geriatrics, cut across all of these. To be a good doctor for older people, you've got to understand not just the disease-based care, and the organ-based care, but the integration of care across all of these. And uh, very exciting to see at the Alexandra Hospital an integrated medicine clinic so that you folks are, are also embracing this notion of integrated care. So geriatrics is a field that can really do this and bring all of these disciplines together for the benefit of our patients. But one of the big problems is the lack of geriatricians around the world. Uh, there is a true shortage, a workforce shortage, which is a real crisis that w despite this burgeoning population I told you about, this great increase in baby boom generation who are turning 70, the number of geriatricians, at least in our country, and I'm sure this is true in yours, is 
falling rather than increasing. Uh, we need about 20,000 geriatricians. I'm sorry, uh, we need about 20,000 now. By 2030, we need about 36,000, that's the estimates. But we only have about 7,000 qualified geriatricians who have gone through training in this field. Um, they only com they compromise or comprise about 0.5% of all medical educators in the United States. That's a tiny fraction of all the medical doctors who are teaching. So how can our students learn geriatrics if we don't have enough teachers? Many of those people who originally um, got their boards in geriatrics and became specialists are now retiring. And uh, therefore, we really have a, a challenge to train all primary care physicians in geriatrics so that we have enough to care for our large population. This is just a graph showing uh, who has been certified in geriatrics. The first board exam, which I took in 1988, um, trained about 2,400, uh, or certified about 2,400 geriatricians. This began to increase in the first decade. We were going fairly well, um, but currently we're seeing a reduction in the number of certified geriatricians. And part of that is because those who got their certificates um, did not renew them uh, 10 years later when the next exam was offered. So this is a crisis in our country. I know in your country it's hard to, to recruit people into geriatrics. Part of it's financial because we pay them so low. Um, so this is a, a real problem if we're going to care for this large population. So how can we actually extend the knowledge base of geriatric medicine to all doctors, to uh, practicing physicians, family medicine doctors, even to our specialists, so that they can help pick up the, um, the slack and take care of older people uh, if geriatricians are not available to do so. And one approach is to leverage these scarce resources in geriatrics through technology. And one of the technological innovations that I'm very excited about is called ECHO. It stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. And what it is, it's a video consultation program that was first developed in New Mexico in the United States to treat hepatitis C. A doctor named uh, Sanjeev Arora <laughs> Uh, recognized that there were lots of people with hepatitis C in the very rural, poor communities of New Mexico who didn't have access to specialists in hepatitis or liver disease. So he created a video communication so that the specialists in the hospital in Albuquerque, New Mexico, could communicate with doctors three or four hours away and teach them how to manage the care of those patients living so far away that they couldn't get to the academic medical center. Um, the goal was to train these community providers to become local experts. And he now has over 20 echo clinics covering a variety of conditions all over the world that are using this video communication technology. So when we do an echo, we'll have a screen in front of us and we'll see doctors from miles away all on that screen who are presenting cases to us so that we can discuss these geriatric cases and help them do a better job of caring for those patients. We call our program ECHO AGE, and again, it's remote video consultation to bring geriatric expertise to nursing homes and remote healthcare agencies. Every week we have these online conferences with a multidisciplinary team sitting in our hospital, talking to people in facilities around the region and beyond, as far as northern Maine, and uh, we can reach out uh, to a variety of different people, hospitalists, nursing home physicians, and community-based primary care physicians using common technology as simple as FaceTime uh, or Zoom, which are downloadable free um, apps that actually enable us to do this in a secure fashion. So uh, health care uh, is in crisis, um, at least in our country, because of its costs. Um, this just shows um, the uh, costs in this purple line, uh, the spending of our um, um, health care system. You can see the United States is above all other countries shown here on the x-axis. Singapore is here, although I understand you're about 4% of your GNP, although I'm not sure how that's counted. Um, but for the life expectancy that is achieved, uh, we really spend an awful lot of money. So this is really a problem, and we need different models of care in order to deal with this. This is what's going to happen in our country. 
Uh, patients are going to come to the healthcare system. We're going to say, I'm sorry, we're bombarded with aging boomers. Come back in about 20 years uh, because we aren't going to be able to accommodate everybody if we don't do something about these costs. Um, the uh, costs are also shown here. The annual per capita health care costs as a function of age, you can see, are just skyrocketing in the United States, um, particularly as people get over age 65 and are much lower in uh, other European countries in the UK. So we need new models of care in order to deal not only with cost, but in order to increase the health span of our older population. And this is a depiction of the conventional uh, model of care, which is hospital-centric. Most of the care, and I know that's true here in Singapore as it is in our country, puts the hospital in the center of the universe. Patients leave the hospital. If they're lucky, they go home, but they often go to a nursing home or, a, in your case, a community hospital or, in our case, a rehab uh, setting, eventually go home. But if they get sick, they come right back to the hospital as the first place that they seek care. This is a conventional system. If we're lucky, we can send a nurse to the home and provide some care. But again, this is the center of the universe. So the goal is to shift the whole paradigm. And in our country, in our programs at Hebrew Senior Life and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, we want to put the patient in the center of the universe. We all want to be in our home as long as we possibly can, and we would rather bring services to ourselves so that the hospital only becomes a resource, one of many resources that enable us to stay healthy at home. So now in this model, yeah, we use the hospital when we need it, but hopefully we can avoid that by having all these other services keep us healthy in the home environment. Pharmacy services can come to the home. Physicians can come to the home or the patient can go to the office if necessary, but still remain at home. I, um, emergency medical services can actually come to the patient of the home, but they can even deliver care in the home. Many of these EMS services can actually now deliver care. Palliative care can be delivered in the home. Home health, community supports, and long-term care can all now be centered uh, in the patient living in their home environment. Um, I work at a program, as you've heard, called Hebrew Senior Life, which has built, has uh, eight different campuses. It has built housing. It's a hospital, it's a nursing home type of organization, but it has built housing facilities to keep people in the community. And these are just some examples of our, our housing facilities. Um, some of them are what we call continuing care retirement communities, where people buy fairly luxurious apartments, and if they get sick, there's a nursing home on site, there's a rehab unit on site, so they can get all the care they need on site and um, stay in that environment. And then we've built uh, housing, such as those shown here, which are subsidized housing. These are for poor people who require government subsidies in order to live in these apartments. But this one, for example, is on the beach in a, a town called Revere, Every apartment has a view of the ocean. It's beautiful, there are beautiful apartments, all subsidized by our government housing and urban development programs. Here is another one, and here is another one. And then, uh, if needed, they can come to our long-term care facility in, uh, called Hebrew Rehabilitation Center, which is a nursing home. And now we're creating models of nursing home care where instead of having these large wards where people live, we can have individual rooms and then living rooms, even kitchens, so patients can come out and live like they would at home in these environments where they can sit in the living room to read the paper, sit in front of a fireplace, go to the kitchen any time of day or night and take out something from the refrigerator if they're hungry, rather than have to wait to a, for a certain hour when the food is delivered uh, on trays or, or big carts. So this is a, a new set of um, care, new models of care, that we're very excited by the interest of folks here, and uh, I'm really delighted that we're now sharing uh, information about these models, and we're learning from you, and uh, you're learning from us. This is just an example, uh, seniors in the middle, and all of the different services can be brought to them. Dining is important, fitness and wellness, home care, educational programs, trips and events, 
recreational program physicians, spiritual services, housekeeping and maintenance are all brought into the housing facilities that we build so that we have this whole array. And we're now doing a project to actually prove that we can reduce hospitalizations and prove, improve the health of our population through these interventions. So the good news is that, in fact, we are making some headways in the field of aging. Um, there are some reductions we're beginning to see in disease and disability. Um, cardiovascular disease and stroke are falling in prevalence in our country. We hope to soon be developing drugs or vaccines for Alzheimer's disease. We're talking about increasing retirement age. Many more people are living, are working into their 70s, 75, even 80. Um, we're developing elder-friendly cities and facilities. We have housing options with health care and services in the housing such so that we can age in place. There's less reliance on hospitals. And now we're also focused on what we call personalized medicine, where each person can achieve, can determine their own goals of care, and we in the healthcare industry can help them achieve their personal goals. So how should we all prepare for old age? Well, in summary, we need to keep mentally and physically active. We need to keep socially engaged. We really need to embrace preventive medicine while we're healthy, or at least until age 80. And this includes some very important preventive measures which have been proven to reduce disease and disability. And they include treating high blood pressure, cholesterol, maintaining a normal weight, stopping smoking, cancer screening, particularly colon and breast treating pneumonia and taking pneumonia vaccines to prevent pneumonia in older age, treating, uh, giving people hepatitis vaccinations for A and B, flu and zoster vaccines are now available to prevent these diseases, vision screening, hearing and hearing aids, and dental care. Adopting a Mediterranean diet with fish and vegetables, um, vitamin D, we talked about in modest alcohol, but not excessive alcohol, and then advanced care planning, establishing personal goals of care, determining what people would want at the end of life so that we can provide that, developing wills and estates, housing options, long-term care, and stopping driving for those that are no longer able to do it reliably. These are interventions that I think will help all of us live a healthier and happier and maybe longer life. So just with it's never too old. Here's a woman at age 92 celebrating her birthday by skydiving. I hope I can do that. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the moments that remain. So we have time for a couple questions, but before we do that, I want to warn you about this Mahjong thing, because uh, <laughs> I met this, uh, uh, was fortunate to meet this very famous scientist in his 80s and uh, lived in uh, China. And went to his house and he found out I didn't play mahjong and so he made it his goal over the next two or three hours to teach me how to play mahjong and in the process I lost about four or five hundred renminbi so just be careful. <laughs> <laughs> that is the risk. <laughs> I was interested in seeing that you have a vaccine coming for Alzheimer. Well. Um, work in progress. What is the vaccine and when will it be available? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is a work in progress. Um, the initial vaccine trials unfortunately resulted in what we call encephalitis, a large, you know, inflammation of the brain. Um, but many of the drug companies are now trying to work on a variety of different approaches uh, to getting rid of the amyloid protein. Amyloid is a protein deposited in the brain. And if we can either uh, encourage our own immune system to get rid of it or use other drugs to get rid of it, it's an approach that's being tested. Uh, I wish it were further along. It is not yet ready and probably won't be for a number of years, but uh, we're hopeful. So uh, maybe uh, you could comment a little bit more about this personalized approach because we use the term personalized medicine, but it's really personalized aging as well. And you know, I think when it comes to any of these interventions, uh, it's really, you know, nothing is probably going to work for everyone, maybe exercise in some form. but. The challenge is really finding out what's unique about aging as well as what's in common. And so, uh, you know, I don't know what you think about the, how personalized the aging approach is, or aging is going to be. Yeah, the term um, that I use, personalized aging, really encompasses a variety of different approaches. Um, you're absolutely right. One size does not fit all. 
We say in geriatric medicine, if you know one geriatric patient, you know one geriatric patient. Meaning that you can't always generalize. Everybody's different and has a different combination of conditions. So, you know, at some point we may be able to scan the genome. Uh, in fact, some of this is actually beginning to be put into practice where we can actually determine um, the response to drugs. Um, for example, we now have many wonderful drugs that can treat bone loss called osteoporosis, but not everybody responds to them. So we can now actually determine uh, who will be a responder and who won't on the basis of a genetic profile that can now be done. Aspirin, not everybody responds to aspirin, and so there are a number of ways we can now begin to look at the metabolism of the drug and its interactions to determine who will respond and who won't. Warfarin, uh, which unfortunately is not being used as much anymore, also has different effects in different people. So I do think we're going to be doing what's called pharmacogenomics, where we're beginning to look at your personal profile and then tailor make a drug cocktail for you uh, that would be more effective than, than somebody else. So that's one type of personalized medicine that is now really quite active. But other types are personalized in the, in the sense of what do you want? You know, right now, if you have a pneumonia and in your, your, your 100 years old, you develop a pneumonia in your house, you're going to be taken by the ambulance to a hospital. Just everybody gets treated the same way. Well, no, if we can do personalized medicine and talk to what would you want? Would you want to go to the hospital? Would you want treatment at home? Would you want nature to take its course? These are the kinds of discussions we're now having, which we also call personalized medicine. And a third is um, personalizing your goals. So I work in a long-term care environment. We have these housing facilities. And we now have a program called Vitalize 360, where we actually sit down. We have coaches sit down with everybody and say, Okay, you're 95. What are your goals in life? You know, nobody thought that a 95-year-old had goals, but they do. Um, one lady said, you know, I've never ridden a horse my whole life. I'd like to ride a horse. And you know what? We got her a horse. And we pulled up a horse in a trailer and <laughs> brought it out and got her on that thing. But others might say, look, my goal is to get to my daughter's wedding. After that, I can pass away. It's all right. And, and we personalize by actually identifying personal goals and making, helping people achieve them. Uh, Professor Lipsix, um, what is your definition of dementia? Um, I, uh, I mean, you mentioned memory loss. I hope I can find my way back to my car afterwards. Um, I mean, I forget things quite often. And uh, so what would, be a, what would be your definition of dementia? It's not just memory loss. Yeah, thank you for that question. A lot of people ask this because we often just use it, throw it around, and people think it's synonymous with Alzheimer's, etc. Dementia is a symptom. It's a symptom like headache, shortness of breath. It's a symptom that implies cognitive problems, and usually memory. So memory loss and dementia are, are pretty synonymous, but many of these problems don't just affect, dementia doesn't always just affect memory. It can affect your ability to plan and organize, which is called executive function. It can plan your, affect your visual spatial activities. But generally we use, in, in general terms, dementia to mean there's been a cognitive problem where somebody's lost memory. Now, just like shortness of breath, there are dozens of causes. It could be heart disease, it could be lung disease, it could be anemia, it could be anything. So true of dementia. It's a symptom that could be due to a lot of different things. Um, it could be done, due acutely to a drug. It could be to thyroid disease, to vitamin deficiencies. But mostly, if it's chronic, if it lasts a long time, it is the most common cause is Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is a disease that can cause dementia. And, but of course, vascular disease, strokes, can also cause dementia. Um, many things can, because it's simply a symptom. Um, endorphins. Endorphins, uh, endorphins are a very favorite subject, you know, and it's claimed to stimulate brain activity. How good is it in um, preventing or slowing down the onset of dementia? Boy, I'm not aware that that's actually been tested. Um, 
Endorphins are certainly the things that are generated by exercise, by you know, a variety of, of activities that, and, and result in sort of emotional responses, but I don't know that they've been studied. Do you know? Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. Be interesting question. That's what I love about geriatrics. There are tons of questions we don't know the answer, so we've got to do research to find the answer to these. <laughs> Hi, Prof. Uh, very interesting talk. So a couple of drugs that you mentioned, uh, like metformin, control of cholesterol, statins and all. I don't know if you mentioned statins or not. Uh, increases the lifespan, but how do you actually differentiate that the drug actually manages the disease that, and from that you get the healthy lifespans or the drug directly act on the lifespan itself? Yeah, um, there you're absolutely right. These drugs are used for diseases. So is it, are you really treating the disease or are you um, uh, extending life in some other mechanism? And, um, you know, animal studies have looked at some of these, these drugs, animals that are healthy, and they can actually extend lifespan. Um, in, there are epidemiologic studies comparing diabetics, for example, who are on metformin to those that are not on metformin, matching as much as you can other factors, and that's hard to do. And those on metformin tend to live longer than those not on metformin. So that's another way that you try to dissect out the effect on longevity versus the effect on the disease. So, but, it, but we don't know until we actually do clinical trials and test things prospectively and randomize people to a drug or to a placebo or something else. And th those drugs are actually being planned. There's a trial called the TAME trial that's currently being planned. Hopefully our NIH will fund it, but um, we don't know yet because we haven't done the experiment in humans to see whether uh, what the effect is.